Let's open our Bibles. If you have your Bible, we'll start off in Proverbs chapter number 2. Proverbs chapter number 2. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter number 2, and we'll just read a few verses to kind of show you the contrast uh, that we're going to preach about tonight, a constant theme all throughout the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter number 2, we'll look down in verse number 7. Notice in Proverbs chapter 2, verse number 7, He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. So you see in verse 7, the righteous are mentioned. Then notice down in verse number 14, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the forwardness of the wicked. So we see this constant contrast in the book of Proverbs between the righteous and the wicked. So we've kind of studied the contrast between the wise and the foolish. And so in this message, we're going to look at the contrast between the righteous and the wicked. Now, Obviously, when you think of someone righteous in the setting of the Bible, you think, okay, well, someone righteous is someone who's living right, and someone who is wicked is someone who is living wrong. So you take the word right, and you give the antithetical word wrong. So that's kind of an easy way to look at it. What I want to do before we get into the practical application tonight is to look in some Old Testament passages, and we'll begin um, here in Proverbs, since we're already here, if you'll come over to chapter number 10. Actually, uh, yeah, chapter 10 is okay. And I want to show you the understanding that we get from the Old Testament specifically about the righteous and the wicked. Because this is where a lot of people get confused because there's a lot of verses in the Old Testament about this and then they take these verses that teach about the righteous and then they begin to apply them to us now and the reason people get confused is because in the Old Testament, God promises, gives a specific promise to Old Testament righteous people regarding health, regarding wealth, and prosperity. In other words, if you live right, you will be blessed. If you live wrong, you will be cursed. That's the Old Testament principle. I want you to see that because a lot of time, especially... In the uh, modern age, when you hear these prosperity preachers and so forth, they'll grab these verses from the Old Testament and preach those things and try to get people to give money and things like that so they can get people to think that they're going to be blessed by God if they live a certain way. And the, the truth of the matter is this. You can live a good life and get it in the neck. You can have a bad time living a good way. I mean, think about it in the New Testament. We have Paul the Apostle, the greatest New Testament Christian that we know of. He wrote three-quarters of the Bible, three-quarters of the New Testament, rather. He gets killed for Christ. He doesn't die in prosperity. He dies in being betrayed, and he dies a martyr's death. And so you want to make sure you keep all this in perspective because the Old Testament presents a vastly different scenario than what we experience oftentimes as New Testament Christians. And if you're not careful... You will take these verses or read through in your Bible and you'll see these things. You'll think, why is all this stuff happening to me? I'm trying to go to church. I'm trying to read my Bible. I'm trying to live right and all these bad things are happening. Well, that's normal. Don't think it's not normal. So let's look at some of these. You're in Proverbs chapter number 10. Come down to verse number 3. The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish. But he casteth away the substance of the wicked. That reminds me of Psalm 34. You've probably heard it before. The righteous cry, the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. What about verse 19? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Well, uh, what about the martyrs? What about people that you've studied in church history and you've read about and great men and women of the faith that were not delivered? You're in Proverbs. Look over in chapter number um, 13. Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 21. Look at this. Evil pursueth sinners, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. If you're righteous, then you're going to be blessed. Look in verse number 25. 
The righteous eateth to the satisfying of his soul, but the belly of the wicked shall want. That reminds me of another verse in Psalm 37. He says, I've been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Now, you would have to say the Bible is a lie or the Bible has contradictions if you force these Old Testament passages into New Testament Christianity. There are people that are saved and living right in this world, not necessarily in our prosperous America right now, but in this world that are wondering where their next meal is going to come from. And they're saved, they love God, they're living right, and Psalm 37 is in their Bible. So if you don't have a dispensational understanding, in other words, if you don't realize God dispenses truth differently in different ages, and you start applying things that you read just because it's in the Bible, there's all kinds of things in the Bible. But the Lord told the Jews when they go into land, you kill everybody, man, woman, and child. Where are you going to apply that to? You're going to tell your kids, okay, we need the neighbor's property, go take care of them for us. I and mean, what kind of nonsense is that? You know, just because something is quote-unquote in the Bible doesn't mean it has application now. So, you know, make sure you rightly divide the word of truth. And or you'll get very confused. You think, you know, I've been praying for healing and, you know, God healed people in Jesus' day. And how come God's not healing me? I have these bills. I need these bills to be made. And, and how come God's not blessing me? You'll get real confused really quick unless you properly divide. Uh, turn over to chapter um, chapter 15. Look at this, 15.6, Proverbs 15.6. So when you read a lot of these verses about the righteous, you're going to see this. That's why I need to cover this before we get into the practical stuff. Proverbs 15.6, in the house of the righteous, look at this, is much treasure. Now, if you invite me home this evening, I'd like to look at your treasures. You're living for God, surely, you know, you have... Your portfolio is huge and you can go ahead and retire. And you got all this extra money just laying around the house. It's all through here. Um, look in verse, um, let's see, come back to um, chapter 11. Let's try to keep you in Proverbs tonight so you don't have to flip all the way through. Look in chapter 11, come down to verse number 8. The righteous is delivered out of trouble. Look in verse number 21. Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished. In other words, they will get punished. But the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. Bad people get it and good people get delivered. It's like just the opposite in our country. <laughs> in our country, if you're a scallywag, you get elected to office. And you can get away with anything. Right? If you go out and kill people and do stuff, then they will take care of you. If you do go to prison, they'll feed you for 30 years and take care of you and get in all this kind of stuff. But if you live right, uh, you're going to have to scrimp and save for everything that you have. And life is toil and trouble. I'll give you some other passages. Second Chronicles chapter number 6. This is when Solomon is praying that great prayer that he prays for the nation. And you have to keep in perspective because here's Solomon, which is David's son, and he's over the nation of Israel, and God is blessing that kingdom of priests, like we mentioned this morning, and God is going to use Solomon to show his glory throughout the whole known world at that time, and he does. For 40 years of peace, Solomon reigns on the throne, and they have so much prosperity. Silver, the Bible says, is nothing to be accounted of. And it says in Second Chronicles chapter 6, Solomon prays, he says, Hear from heaven and do, and judge thy servants by requiting the wicked, by recompensing his way upon his own head, and by justifying the righteous, by giving him according to his righteousness. Now that's a whole different concept than New Testament Christianity. New Testament Christianity, when we think of righteousness, we think of the righteousness of Christ. We don't want to be recompensed according to our righteousness because all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Theologically speaking, we don't see our righteousness as adding up to anything of value. In the Old Testament, it's just the opposite. In the Old Testament, when you read Ezekiel chapter number 18, it talks about the, the righteousness of the righteous and the wickedness of the wicked. And he basically says, look, if you live righteous, then you will live. If you live wicked, you will die. 
If you do wrong, you're going to get punished. If you live right, God's going to bless you for it, and He'll give you long life, and He'll satisfy you. You know, that's what happened when Job got into the trouble he got into. He was scratching his head. Of course, he was using a pot shirt, you know, an old pot, and he's scraping all the boils as he scratches his head. And he's like, why is all this happening to me? Because the Bible tells us in the first part of Job, he was an upright man, one that feared God and eschewed evil. He shooed evil away, right? Job was a good man. And his world fell apart. His friends came, and they're great theologians, you know, graduated from the cemeteries around the road, down the road, and they come down and they sit, and they begin to postulate, and they begin to form their philosophies and their opinion as to why Job is in this predicament. Job 4, verse number 7, the verse says this, Remember, I pray thee, one of his friends, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the righteous cut off? In other words, Job... You're not innocent. Something's wrong in your life. Something must have been wrong with your kids. Something must be wrong with your wife. Something must be wrong with you. For all this bad stuff to happen, you are bad, Job. And Job's like, look, you can examine my life. And he goes through and he tells all the things he did. He helped out the poor. I mean, he did all kind of things. He can't figure it out because in the Old Testament setting, the revelation that they had been given was that God would bless the righteous physically with prosperity and with health. It's all through there. So you want to understand that when you read through these verses, and we can obviously take devotional application, and that's what we're going to go tonight, but in the Old Testament dispensation, there's an obvious difference in that. And so you want to get that. Now... We're going to look at these two contrasting paths because they do contrast. And we have righteous people and we have wicked people. And today, we still have the same thing. You can look around and just back up and say, you know, that person, the way they're living, that's a wicked lifestyle. Whether they're saved or not, they are living a wicked lifestyle. That person is living a righteous life. We use some of the phraseology, even though we know theologically all are sinners. We say, well, so-and-so is a good person, even though we know theologically there is none good, no, not one. But you still can use the statement just like you'll find in the Bible. I'll give you a verse, I think, we'll hit it, where he talks about the, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. We use the phrase, well, so-and-so is a good man. Or we say, so-and-so is good people. We use that phrase all the time. And you mean they're living in our estimation, our standards. They're not out cheating anybody. They're not harming their family. They're living a quote-unquote good life. You would have to check out your common sense not to be able to see those things. You say, well, you mean to tell me you make discriminations? Who doesn't make discriminations and judgments about everything in life? I mean, here comes a, a dog walks up. The dog's showing all of his teeth, and he looks like, you know, he, he, he's, he's got the rabies, rabies, rabies or something. He's coming up snarling and growling, and you think he's, you know, he's just coming up, you know, wanting you to pet him. And No, you got to use your common sense. This dog's about to bite me. You see somebody walking down the road or you see somebody, you know, you're talking to somebody and every other word is an expletive and they don't have any regard or respect for people. They're acting a certain way. You are to make certain assumptions. Don't check out common sense at the door. So when you see righteousness and you see wickedness, you can obviously judge those things. Vance Havner, the old preacher, he said, At the rate our nation is decaying, we will soon have to change our national symbol from an eagle to a vulture. It's a true statement. Somebody said, live so that when people speak evil of you, nobody will believe it. You should be living a good, quote-unquote, life. Paul talked a lot about good works. It's a sad state of affairs when you have people that aren't even saved that sometimes are better to their neighbors than Christians are. And there are some, quote-unquote, good people out there that don't even know the Lord. They'll give the shirt off their back. So let's look at this tonight. I want to first of all look at the ways and the walk of these two paths. Look in chapter 15. <clears throat> there's a certain path that's the path of the wicked, and there's a certain path that's the path of the righteous. Now, I wouldn't say that the path of the righteous is paved nice and smooth. And I wouldn't always say that the path of the wicked is always rocky. So there's some things as you go through Proverbs and see these things, and as they begin to unfold, you'll begin to notice and have discernment. Okay, this is the wrong path. This is, there's something not right about this trail. You ever go hiking or something? 
I've told you the story many times of Christy and I up in the Smoky Mountains, and we say, oh, we'll just take this little hike. You know, it says two miles or whatever. Or, you know, when you see those little signs, yeah, that's, that's two miles, but you're going like this and this. And it takes a long time to go two miles in the woods. And if you have to, ladies, if you have to go to the bathroom before the trip, you might not want to take the little two-mile journey. Um, but nonetheless, and if your shoes are already wearing holes in, you know, the side of your feet, it might not be a good time to take that little trek. And you're walking along the path, or have you ever gotten to a place and you think, well, I don't think this is the right trail. And you begin to notice some things about the path and notice some things about the trail. That type of mindset, as we go through Proverbs, that's what you want to do. So let's look at it, Proverbs chapter 15. Look in verse number 9. The way of the wicked, that's a path, that's a road of the way, is an abomination unto the Lord. But he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Look down in verse number 19. The way of the slothful is, an, uh, is a hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. So we have contrast here. We have a way of the wicked that's said to be an abomination. And then we also have the way of the righteous which is made plain. So there's some things that are clear and plain and straight about the way of the righteous. There's some things about the way of the wicked that are crooked and perverse. And you can notice those things. Um, Proverbs chapter 4, it says, The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. In Proverbs 12, he says, The way of righteousness is life. In the pathway there, there is no death. So we have this contrast where the way of life is plain. The way of, uh, the, way of the righteous is a plain path. It's a, a path that has light on it. The way of the wicked is as darkness, is crooked. It's the, the slothful way, the sluggard way. You're walking along the way and everybody's just hanging out. Nobody wants to work and the thorns and thistles and everything's growing up, you know. There's something wrong about that path. And that's a contrast to the way of the righteous. The way of the righteous has light. The way of the righteous is plain. It's straight. It doesn't, uh, there's no confusion there. It's clarity. So when we think about this way, what do you do with these trails? Well, what's good, what's, what's, what's the use of having a trail if it's not walked on? You know, the old paths, one good thing about the old paths, they've been worn out. And if you've ever, um, maybe you see aerial footage, you ever get on Google Earth, you know, and you can see all this aerial footage. You can go to places to maybe where uh, people have, it's been deserted for a long time or whatever, and they can still point out the old, old roads. Or if you had a place that was a road for a long time, because that thing had been beaten down and beaten down and ridden over year after year after year, even if it's been deserted, if it's some old hunting club or something that's where they used to always ride on it, now it's not a hunting club anymore, nobody's riding back there. If you still see that footage, you can still tell where there was a path because the thing has been, it's been walked on. And these old paths that we're called to go on as Christians... The path is steadfast, is sure, it's been, it's been walked on. You're not going to get in a place to where it's not stable. It's a stable path. And we're to walk on that path. And so when you think about walking on this path, we walk and he says that in Proverbs chapter number 3, thou shalt walk in thy way safely and thy foot shall not stumble. If you go on that old path, it's a tried and true and proven path. Look, I'm not all about just basing your life on experiences of others. However, this thing we call the old-time religion, this thing we call the Christian life, is not just some new experience that we're trying to jump into in 2020. This is something that has been tried and true for centuries now, for a few thousand years now. Christians have gone through this path, and they've walked it and walked it and walked it. And like the old adage is, it's good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. And so you want to realize about this path. We can walk on this path and you can trust this path. It's a safe path. And the wicked, they walk in the paths of darkness, as we've already given you. Now, we talk about the, the wicked. They walk a path and they have a, um, an attitude as they go in this path. Come to chapter number 12. We'll talk about the righteous and the wicked, not just the path they're traveling, which you can tell a lot of a lot about somebody as to where they're going. You look at somebody and you say, where did you just come from? Okay, that gives me some information. Now, where are you headed? That gives me some more information. 
And if you see where somebody is heading, that tells you a lot about that person. And notice in chapter number 12, come to Proverbs chapter 12, look down in verse number 5. The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. So the word righteous, we have the word right. With the wicked, we have these counsels, but we have the word deceit associated with it. So we're talking here about the heart, how these attitudes, so the direction somebody's going, they had it in their mind and in their thoughts and in their counsels to go in that direction from somebody, somewhere. And so what we're going to see is that the wicked and the righteous think oppositely. And they have a different mindset and they also have a different heart. They say you know a person by what they love and by what they hate. And you can tell a lot about a person by what they love. In chapter 15, look over in Proverbs chapter 15. Do you remember when we studied the things God hates back in Proverbs 6? He talked about the heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. So your heart thinks. There's a connection between your head and your heart, and it's not your esophagus, amen. <laughs> There's a connection between your head and your heart, and you, as a wise person, you're not supposed to just think with your head. You're supposed to think with your heart. Out of the heart are the issues of life. See, you say, well, I'm just going to think with my head. Well, you're just going to run on knowledge and you're not going to enter into understanding and discretion. You want to make sure you think with your heart and make sure God has your heart. Notice in Proverbs chapter number 15, verse number 28. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. So the heart of the righteous studieth the answer. And notice he is studying so he can get the answer. But the wicked person just opens his mouth as we preached last time with fools and removes all doubt as to whether he's a fool or not. He's not studying. He's just saying, blah. <laughs> and so this leads us to the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the righteous so you can see the contrast. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So you say, well, I really have a problem with my mouth. Okay, well, you need to really get to the root of the problem. The problem's not your mouth. The problem's your heart. If you get the heart right, then the things you say will be right. Look in chapter 15. You're still there. Come down to verse number 26. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. So we have this in two different verses how thoughts are connected to words. He says in chapter 26, verse 23, Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a potsherd covered with silver dross. In other words, the wicked, he'll keep saying things and saying things and try to cover up his heart. You ever see a, a wicked person get into a place to where he's really got to watch himself so he doesn't cuss and say things he shouldn't say? I'll never forget, we were at a community meeting in Georgia one time. And it was at a church. It was a, a community situation that had to be addressed with homeowners and so forth. And the meeting was at the church. Pretty big church and a lot of folks there. And we had the sheriff there. And he got up and he said several things real quick to give himself away. You could tell he was nervous being in a pulpit. And I picked up on it just like that. And he's like, I better, I got to watch myself. You know, I'm not. He was saying things so he didn't get up there and, and, and say what his heart, his heart's full of wickedness. I'm not trying to be mean tonight, but unsaved people especially, and I'm talking, I mean, old saved people can get away from the Lord and they can say bad things, but unsaved people, their heart is full of wickedness. And it's going to come out. And I've told you the story before. A guy I worked with one time, I was a young man, this is an older guy, and he keeps cussing, 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 you know, he's always got a foul mouth. And one time he, he had a temper too, you know. And uh, he blew his temper on me one time, and I didn't have anything to do. I told him, I said, number one, my daddy don't talk to me this way, so you sure ain't going to talk to me this way. And the reason you're saying all these nasty things is because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, and you're speaking that way because you're full of that stuff. Amen. Somebody gives you the GD, you tell them that's not God's last name. Amen. All that stuff is perfectly politically acceptable. There's nobody getting offended at all the filthiness and all the filthy talk going on. Everybody's offended about all this other stuff and they're not offended about offending God. 
The wickedness proceeds out of the mouth of the wicked. So that's a sign. You're saying, okay, I want to I be righteous and not wicked. Well, there's a sign that the people are full of wickedness. He says in 1 John, the whole world lieth in wickedness. But the words are definitely a clue for us to understand this. Look in uh, chapter 10. Back in chapter number 10. Proverbs chapter number 10. Look down, if you will, in verse number 11. We mentioned last week about the prating fool in verse 8 and verse number 11. Uh, prating is, is like the word to uh, prattle, is like to like, uh, chat, uh, chatter, like to tattle, to babble, to just constantly run off the mouth. So he mentions in verse number 11, the mouth of the righteous man is a well of life, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. You ever get around somebody that's wicked and, and, and count how many things they curse out and they're cussing out? And, they're, and they're, they're condemning this and condemning that and condemning that. I know one old preacher, he used to say every time he got on a plane, he asked God to take all the, the uh, curses off of it. <laughs> You're in chapter 10, back up to verse, or come down to verse number 21. In contrast, the lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for want of wisdom. So the wicked person, they're just, it's just violence, it's just, there's nothing that profits anybody standing around. I mean, what, what are they doing to feed anybody? You ever think about your spiritual life? You come and you sit, and I know you do it on your own with your Bible devotion and time with God, and you spend time with the Lord, and you feed, obviously, spiritually. But when you come and sit here, you know what you're feeding on? You're feeding on me opening my mouth. I'm the mama bird, and you're the baby birds. <laughs> Back when we had the little building out here that we parked, used to park the van under, we had a, a, a little bird's nest up there, and I'd watch that thing every day and watch those uh, little birds. You know, you see it every spring somewhere. You know, those little baby birds, you'll hear them things... Going out, and then you get you start coming out, and they think you're the mama bird, and they're sticking and oh, 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 opening their mouth, oh, oh. you know, like I'm not the mama, I ain't giving you nothing, and they're just opening their mouth, opening their mouth because the mama bird's going to feed them with her mouth. A wise person will say something that will feed you spiritually, and let's just look at it in as far as terms of life. If you get around somebody that has some experience, maybe you're dealing with something, let's say in your personal life and you want your mother's advice, grandmother's advice, or an older person's advice, and you say, hey, you know, you ever been through something like this before? And you ask them, you're waiting for an answer. And you're going to take what they're telling you and their wisdom, and you're going to feed on that, and you're going to digest that, and let it get inside of you, and hopefully produce some good results. So we feed on the Word of God, and as believers, we are to put out the Word of God so other people can feed on that. That's what a wise person does. The Bible says over in the New Testament, he says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, I think. In other words, when you speak, you ought to be speaking like the oracle, the oral, uh, that word oral, we get it from mouth. The oracle is the holy place where God spoke off the mercy seat to Moses. We are to speak as the oracles of God. Uh, Paul said in Colossians, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So we ought to have an answer biblically. You say, well, you might not know the verse, but you can say, you know, the Scripture teaches us such and such. And you give out words of wisdom. Proverbs 10, 32, The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked speaketh frowardness. Proverbs 16, 13, Righteous lips are delight of kings, and they love him that speaketh right. So there's a lot with that. Now, let's, let's move into this. We'll wrap it up. I want you to look at the acts and deeds of the righteous because we can see several things. So it goes from the, obviously we see the path they're going on, and then we take that and we see the heart that's producing all of these things to decisions to go on these paths. And we begin to see the philosophies, the ideas that they have. It's no wonder there's a lot of the craziness going on in our country today. I mean, think about it. Where are they developing their thoughts and ideas for their conclusions? They're not getting them from the Bible. You look at this modern, when you get into um, society and you begin to realize we're dealing with a culture now that is developing and very much so they, a lot of the younger culture is embracing this socialistic mindset. They really are. They really think this is a great idea. 
And some of you older folks, you can't even believe that people think that way as Americans. You have about 50 years of brainwashing funded by public education. Especially when you look at statistics, higher education. You look at the majority of people who don't believe in God, they are, they're, they're college educated. You have to be educated out of a belief in God. And so when you begin to think of this whole thing as far as uh, social studies go and society goes, people are coming up with these conclusions because they've been fed this and they've been taught this and they've been programmed this way for so long. And you've even gotten to a place in Christianity where Christians have gotten so far away from their Bibles. And preachers, consequently, because they're just preaching over their congregation's heads because they keep simpling it, making it more and more simple, so they really you don't have nothing else to preach but John 3.16 because nobody can keep, get any deeper than a mud puddle. So consequently, Christians don't even know God's mind on things. We're in a bad, bad fix. So what does this produce? It produces acts and deeds, not just thoughts and philosophies and ideas. Now you carry out those deeds. And you've got just crazy things taking place. Even in your mind, I don't even think that way. I don't think, I wonder sometimes how people can be so infatuated with violence and death. All entertainment is based on somebody getting killed or watching somebody's bones or investigating the guts out of somebody. and People just watch that stuff and think it's just great. Or they want to be entertained by watching some, some uh, news expose on some murder that took place and they spend a whole hour delving into people's private life on how somebody got killed. Something's not right with that. Something's not holy with that kind of stuff. And all the murder and the bloodshed in our country and all the violence, that's not, that's not good. So when we talk about acts and deeds, we'll talk about this righteousness and wickedness. G. Campbell Morgan was an old-time preacher at West, Westminster back before, if you ever heard of D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He was an old-time preacher back in the war years, World War II. They had kind of a revival. You know, he was of the Reformed tradition, not like us, but a great preacher. And so Westminster pulpit is known... Uh, very much so from Morgan and those guys. But those old preachers, they had a way of wording things. I want to read this from G. Campbell Morgan. He said, Holiness has to do with character, righteousness with conduct. That's a good way to think of it. They cannot possibly be separated from each other. They are intimately related as are root and fruit. There can be no fruit unless there is a root. If there be living root, it must issue in fruit. There can be no righteousness unless there is holiness. Holiness must issue in righteousness. Holiness describes being. Righteousness describes doing. So on a practical level, what I want us to do is just let's look at it. Let's look at the deeds of the righteous. Let's look at the deeds of the wicked. Now, the exceptions prove the rule. You can find philanthropists out there. You can find God deniers and God haters that do some good things. But when you really whittle it down, why are they doing those good things? What is their motive? Why do we do good things? We do good things, hopefully, because we want to please Jesus Christ. Because we want to glorify Jesus Christ. Our motive is God, not ourself. A lot of people do good things because they want to feel good about themselves at the end of the day. Now look in Proverbs 21. Generally speaking, the righteous are generous. Look in Proverbs 21. These are some very practical clues. That's why I do recommend read, Pro read a proverb a day. Today was the second. We started over again. I can't tell you how many times I've read Proverbs, literally. Scores and scores of times through the years because you pretty much go through it every month and you go through it in your regular Bible reading and stuff like that. But it will help you formulate the right type of Opinions and discretion about practical life. Look at it. Proverbs uh, 21, verse 26. He coveteth, we'll back up to verse uh, 25. The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. You know, he's, he's his own worst enemy because he's too lazy to work. Verse 26, he coveteth greedily all the day long. And it doesn't help with television and internet and all this other stuff. You know, they got to put ads, you know, put some new clothes that you just can't live without or some new gadget that you got to have. You know, you just got to have this next thing. He coveteth greedily all the day long. 
Here's the contrast. But the righteous giveth and spareth not. The righteous generally is generous. The wicked and the slothful, they're just greedy. They just want something else they can get. So they can take it and consume it upon their own lust. That's why James talks about praying and he says, you pray, you ask, and you don't get it. He goes, why? Because you want to ask for it just so you can consume it upon your own lust. What God will do when you pray, he'll say, why should I answer that? Why do you want that? Do you want it so you can glorify me with it? Okay, well, maybe I'll let you have it then. A lot of times, our focus is for self-pleasure. Notice the righteous, go back to chapter number 12, not only is he generally generous, look in chapter 12, Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 10, strange verse and really only one like its kind in the scripture, a righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. A righteous man will take care of his horse and his mule. He won't do like the old man did because he kept running out. And he didn't want to spend all his money on feed for the mule, so he started putting sawdust with it. He put a little bit of sawdust with it. It wasn't no big deal. You know, and the mule seemed to like it okay, so he just quit, you know, putting more and more sawdust, less and less feed. After a while, it was all sawdust. One morning he came in, his mule's all swelled up, and he's dead and laying on the ground. <laughs> What's the moral of the, of the story? The moral of the story is take care of your mule. All right. <laughs> Now, not to the extent like the other story goes about, you know, the man and the boy and the mule, and they're walking, on, walking, you know, they're riding the mule. Or first, the old man's riding the mule, and they come to one little town, and they're all like, you know, you know, why are you so mean to your son, making him walk all these miles? He goes, yeah, yeah, you're probably right, you know. So he put his son on the mule and let his son ride. They go to the next town, and the town's like, what are you doing letting your, your dad, he's a lot older than you, and he's walking, and you're making him walk, and you're riding a mule. He says, okay, you know. So he puts his dad on the mule. They get to the next mule, and they're in modern-day America, and they say, what in the world are you doing making that mule walk? So what do they do? They do like modern Americans, and they carry the mule. That poor little mule. <laughs> But you know, a righteous man is not going to purposely torture animals. And I'm not one of these, whatever that organization is, that wants to save the owl and kill the unborn baby. I, that's not me, okay? I never have figured that out. The people that are trying to save all the animals from going extinct, they're the ones promoting abortion and promoting not capital punishment. Just, it's just wacko. Uh, you say, well, you know, I'm, 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 you know I, I just you know, feel so sorry for the little cat or little dog or whatever. You don't feel so sorry for the little roach you stepped on yesterday. How come? Well, a roach is different. How so? But the way of the righteous regardeth his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Never forget, I had a neighbor and he had a lot of issues. I won't go into all that growing up and I never forget him, how he treated his horse. He had horses. We used to ride bareback. You know, we thought we were Indians. He used to let me ride his, his uh, favorite horse. His name was Apache. You know, I thought I was John Wayne. Uh, but he would take, I've seen him take like a two by four and hit that horse on the nose with it. Just mean. And he had some abuse problems in his own family and so forth. But I think that was that stuff just playing out with him. But there's something wrong with somebody who just torment an animal like that. And there's something wrong with a, uh, with a mother or father that will beat a child. Now, I'm not talking discipline and correction. I'm talking abuse. That ain't right. There's something wrong with a husband that will beat a wife. Back in the old days, they would take care of that kind of stuff. But you can see that. The righteous, they're generous. The righteous are compassionate. They're going to take care of their own. In chapter 27, 29, verse 7, he says, The righteous consider the cause of the poor, but the wicked regardeth not to know it. Now, I know people take these verses and they twist them in our modern culture, but in Bible times, when someone was poor, they were either one or two things. They were a drunkard and they were slothful and they didn't want to work and everybody knew they were just a loafer, or they had a disability. If somebody was blind, if somebody was lame, they could not work. They did not have a social security system. They didn't have a disability program. They didn't have these type of things that we have today. And so consequently what you'll have people do, kind of like the first part of our message, how they'll take verses and just pull them out. They'll say, well, see, anybody who's poor, we just need to you know, hand them a bunch of money. 
You know what's taking place in this country right now? People are getting more money, getting paid more money not to work than they are going back to work. That's not an incentive to get people out working. I know some people are disabled. I know some people are retired. I get that. But when you enable people not to work, that's not a good thing. The Bible doesn't promote that type of thing. What this, these passages refer to is genuine people that have genuine disabilities, genuine reasons they're poor. I'll give you a good example. Naomi and Ruth. They come back from Moab. They had had an awful experience in Moab. Their husbands had died. They came back into the land. God had a social security program set up in Old Testament times by way the poor could go and glean in the fields. And he told those reapers, he said in Old Testament, don't reap all the corners. You leave some part for the poor people to come where they can have some food. And that's what Ruth did. She went out. And Boaz was a kind man. He told his reapers, he said, look, when you're going along, just drop some stuff. Drop some handfuls of purpose for her so she can pick it up. And you see cases like that where righteous people see people that are genuinely in need and they want to help them. That's a righteous person. A righteous person, another attribute you see in Proverbs chapter 28. Look in 28, verse number 1. Hang in with me. We're just about done. Proverbs 28, 1. Proverbs 28, 1. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. I think that, in my mind's eye, I'm thinking of an uh, outlaw. He goes from town to town, and he changes his name because he's done robbed so many banks. He's done killed so many guys in the Old West. And he's just trying to start a new life, and he's always looking over his shoulder, and every time he sleeps, he sleeps with his gun because he's done made too many people mad. He's always having to flee. He's always on the run. Isn't it a blessing to be able to lay your head on your pillow at night? Now, I know we're in a weird country, and people could, you know, thugs could come breaking in your house from still stuff. I get that. But isn't it a good feeling to know that you haven't, you know, done all these things where you have all these enemies and all these people wanting to come kill you? That's a good feeling. I can't imagine. I would not want to trade the peace and security I have from knowing, look, I hadn't gone off and, and, and stolen stuff from people or killed somebody or done something where people are going to be chasing after me. Like I mentioned, you know, with some of this bad stuff that's happened in our culture, if you're hanging around bad people, bad things are going to happen to you. That's a, that's a promise you see laid out in Proverbs. Typically, generally speaking, I know exceptions prove the rule, but this idea here, the wicked, they're always having to run, always having to look over their shoulder because their past is always catching up to them. That's a terrible way to be. Notice the righteous, it says, are bold as a lion. There's a confidence that comes in knowing you've done the right thing. And we should, we should desire that. It's a good feeling. And, you know, this idea is, is not an idea of self-righteousness in the sense of I'm, you know, saving myself. But you ought to feel good when you do good. That is a good incentive. I know the number one incentive, love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. That he died for all. They which live should not henceforth live in themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. In other words, we do these things because of Jesus Christ. That's number one. But it should feel good to do right. You should have some confidence knowing, you know what, I did the right thing even though I did get fired. <laughs> I did the right thing even though they did talk about me. I did the right thing even though I lost this or even though so-and-so said, I did the right thing. Confidence. Proverbs chapter, you're in 28, look over in 29. Look at this. 29 verse 6. In the transgression of an evil man there is a snare but the righteous doth sing and rejoice. There's a confident spirit. This idea of self-image, as a Christian, we've got to... Paul talks about Christ being formed in you. We've got to constantly have these, these, these do-overs, these remakes. People have these makeovers, right? And they uh, go and they get all the wrinkles sucked out, you know, and get their lips all puffed up and then, you know... All, you older ladies, it's, it's grow old gracefully. Amen. Uh, your hair color is fine. Don't worry about it. Amen. No hair is fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but the idea is this. 
They constantly have to identify with what they're trying to be. It's, it's a disgrace sometimes seeing a grandmother, or even in some cases, especially in Hollywood, great-grandmothers, trying to walk around like teenagers. It's like, come on, uh, you need to dress according to your age here. I'm no fashion expert, but that doesn't go with who you are. <laughs> but as Christians, we have to constantly identify and do makeovers and realize, I'm a Christian. I'm in Christ. I'm complete in Christ, so therefore I can be confident. I don't have to have the world dictate to me how I'm supposed to think and how I'm supposed to act. There should be a little bit of holy boldness to say, you know what, this is what the Bible says and I'm going to do it. And I'm going to sing and rejoice. The world's going to hell, but I'm going to heaven. Amen. Everybody else is crazy, but I have a sound mind because I've got God and I've got the Holy Spirit and I've got the Bible. And you know what, all these devices, you can turn them off. Just whatever you have to do with to keep, you know, your income coming in so you can feed yourself. But other than that, you can still live for God. The wicked, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter number 5, his own iniquity shall take the wicked himself and he shall be holden with the cords of his sin. Two big contrasts. The, the righteous man is confident. He's free in Christ. He's doing the right thing. He's walking the clear path. It's a path less traveled, but it's a good path. He sings, he rejoices, he's generous, he's confident, he's doing what he's supposed to do. The wicked man's always fleeing, always fumbling, always walking in darkness, always looking over his shoulder, and he's constrained. He's not confident. He's not free. His sins are just wrapping around him like a snake coiling up on him, and he's just getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. What a contrast. Finally, we know the end of the wicked is bad. In Proverbs chapter 13, the righteous man hateth lying, but the wicked is loathsome and cometh to shame. It's amazing sometimes how the news and Hollywood and, and all the entertainment industry, how they push up and boast these wicked people. And they talk about all these people and all these people, and then you, you find out a little bit about their life, and you find out how mean they were and how a lot of times godless they were. And it's, it's, it's a shame. Shameful. The righteous considereth the house of the wicked, but God overthroweth the wickedness for their the wicked for their wickedness. You know, there is a day of retribution coming. And though we're de de dealing with different times in the Old Testament, we don't always see the wicked punished. Payday is coming. It might not be Friday or this Friday, but it's coming. There's coming a day of judgment. He says in Ecclesiastes, If thou seest the violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, marvel not that, at the matter. But he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. These judges down here might not do nothing about it, but there's a judge in heaven that's going to settle accounts one day. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. God shall bring thee into judgment with every secret thing, he says, whether it be good or bad. Now with the righteous, I guess we'll close with uh, Proverbs chapter 3. He says in Proverbs chapter 15, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. So that, in contrast, that makes me think, okay, here's this wicked man. He's going down this path. It's a dark path. It's a path growed up with thorns. It's a path that, that, that's full of with abominations. It's a path where he's always looking over his shoulder. He's getting ensnared in things, him own, his own self. And he, he doesn't care about anybody but himself. It's, it's a path of destruction. And he's going down this path. And one, the worst thing about this path is the fact that God's nowhere on that path. God is absent. A righteous person's path may be that road less traveled. It may be few on it. But the Holy Spirit's there. And he hears the prayer of the righteous. I'd rather have God and not have any friends. Look in chapter number 3. Notice this. I like this verse. Come down to verse number 31 to get the contrast. Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. For the forward is abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. There's that secret fellowship with God that each one of us can have. And nobody can take that away from you. Do the right thing. Here's the thing to ask real quick. Is it right? 
If it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. And let's walk the path of the righteous. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for the scriptures. I pray that you help us to apply these principles.